So once again, we're in 1 Thessalonians and in chapter 5. Uh, we are looking at the commands that Paul gives uh, to the Thessalonian believers, to the church, and to us. Uh, they are uh, imperatives. They are not suggestions. They are, um, they are key to Christian living, and they are the result of and the source of blessing for each of us as we seek to uh, submit ourselves to these truths. He has said uh, to them that you um, you need to um, you need to not return evil uh, for evil in verse 15 of chapter 5. See that no one renders evil for evil. And we are to pursue what is good uh, for ourselves and for all. And then uh, these little short, quick commands that are so filled with truth. We are to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every uh, form of evil. So, <clears throat> we have looked at what it is to um, rejoice always, and we have said that that is, um, that is something that only a Christian can do, that joy is a supernatural reality gifted to us by Jesus Christ, and centered in the reality that we are right with our God, that our that uh, it is well with our soul. So our joy is not the same as human happiness, which is dictated by circumstance, but rather it is determined by our relationship with our God, and therefore we can experience that joy in the midst of difficulties, even pain and sorrow, because joy is that settled understanding of our rightness before him. And then we talked about praying without ceasing. Again, uh, it is this idea that we live in his presence, that we are in constant communication and communion with him. I think uh, J John raised an interesting point after we taught on this, that it also means we are not to give up in our prayers. We are to continue to pray persistently. So it is both an attitude of ongoing prayer and a and a command to not uh, lose heart in prayer, not to get discouraged in prayer, but to continue always. And again, we talked about just the idea that in and through the daily issues of our life, we can continually be seeking God's will, talking to him about the circumstances we're in, um, uh, uh, being discerning about sin in our own life, um, confessing those things that are not honoring to him, uh, bringing people before him, uh, to uh, petition for their needs. We, we, we are in this um, um, amazing reality of eternal life, and eternal life is knowing him. And in knowing him, we are in this intimate relationship with him, and so he calls us to commune with him and to uh, I interact with him on an ongoing basis. And then he, and then he says, uh, give uh, thanks in all things. Uh, that this, um, this, again, as rejoicing, is driven out of the, the reality that you know uh, him and that he is the source of all good things, as James 1.17 tells us. You cannot rejoice in the things of life if you don't know him. Life is just filled with trouble as the sparks fly upward. <laughs> Job would say. You're not going to escape uh, trouble. We've talked about this over and over again. In fact, if your expectations are that you're going to escape trouble in this world, you're going to be mightily disappointed all of the time because trouble just follows us because we live in a fallen world and because we still have sin uh, in us. So our expectation is not that we escape trouble somehow by being a Christian. It is rather that we know the God who will see us through that trouble and the God who promises that he will use that trouble for our good. He will use it to change us, to change our character. 
He'll use us to draw us close to him. He'll, he'll use it to give us empathy for people so that we can care for them. And any number of things in the process that he has us in of being conformed into the image of Christ. That process, it is... It is through the truth of God as the Spirit of God brings us to it and leads us in it. And it is in the issues of life that he works it out. So if you're in the process of growing in your patience, then there will be circumstances in your life to test your patience or your love or your compassion or your honesty, or your forgiveness. All of those things that God is dealing with us in, he gives us little quizzes, pop quizzes, I call them, to determine how we're doing. And it is those issues of life, therefore, that we as Christians can look at in a totally different way than you could look at them if you were unsaved. You don't look at them as if things should be right and this bad thing happened and somehow um, I don't deserve this. This isn't fair. Um, I, uh, it, it shouldn't be this way. Because what? Because apart from God, we all walk around in this world thinking we're God <laughs> and everybody should cater to us and meet our needs and all circumstances should be right because that's the way we want it for us because the world centers around us. But now, rather, we know the truth about those circumstances that we will not escape them, but the God of the universe that has saved us has promised us that he is working his good purposes through them if we'll but submit to him. So we therefore can give him a thanks it, is, um, it comes out of a regenerated heart, and it is one of the ways that we can honor and glorify him, because by giving him thanks, we acknowledge all the things we just talked about, that he, in fact, is the source of all good things, and that all things work together for good to us. And we talked about the fact that we are, we are thankful because we have, <clears throat> in, in, um, in the language of, of Ephesians 1, where Paul speaks to the Ephesians church, we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. I, I, the, the things of this world are passing away, but the things that are really important, the things that are eternal, no one can take from you, and they are of the greatest value. And so we possess the things that are of eternal uh, importance, and we therefore can always focus on those things that God has granted us, <clears throat> and we can always be thankful. And we talked about some of those. He's given us our salvation. He has given us eternal life. He has forgiven us. He, is, he has brought us into his family by adoption. He has given us the hope of heaven and an inheritance there. He has saved us from eternal damnation. And he has given us, uh, in, in addition, um, his spirit. That is, God has given of himself, the third member of the Trinity, God himself has come to dwell within us. So if we have God dwelling in us, then what do we lack? And we talked about that before. We, we lack nothing in terms of resources. We lack nothing in, in what God has given to us because he's given us his son to die on the cross for us that we might come to know him. And then he has given us his spirit by which we live. <coughs> by which we live. Um, the, the spirit of God is absolutely essential to our, our Christian living. Um, it, it is... Um, it is a truth that he is the one that makes possible right living in our actions, right thinking, right words, right motives. He is the one that determines that we are worshiping correctly, that our prayers are right, that our service is correct. He is uh, everything to us as Christians. Let me, 
Let's just run through some scriptures and remind ourselves of some things that we know. Go with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, the Lord dialoguing with Nicodemus in this famous account in John 3 and verse 3 says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answers, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you are born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The Spirit of God is the agent by which we are regenerated, that we experience new birth, that we are given a new heart, a heart that can now rightly respond to God, a heart that can love Him. It all is because of the work of the Spirit of God in our salvation. In John chapter 14 then, And we're just hitting on a, a few things here. In John chapter 14 and verse 16, he says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be... Uh, in you. you. You will have the Spirit of God to help you, to help you with all the issues of life. And He will be with you, and He will be in you. He will reside in you forever. So if you have Him with you and in you, you can lack no resources. Because the principal resource that you possess is God himself. And it all comes because you've come to know the Father. And in coming to know the Father, you now possess eternal life, which is knowing him. And in knowing him, he has granted you newness of life and his uh, spirit. Then if you go with me to Ephesians. In Ephesians um, chapter 3. Well, how about Ephesians 1? In Ephesians 1 and verse 17, Paul is praying. He says, I pray is that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory in the, and of the inheritance in the saints. It, it is... Um, it is a prayer that you would understand and therefore experience the power of God in your life as the Spirit enlightens you, opens your eyes. We've talked about this before. It is only by the truth or the doctrine of illumination that you can understand truth, that you can understand the Word of God, that you can have the very wisdom of God available to you. And that's because of the Spirit of God who resides in you. This book is closed to those that don't possess the Spirit of God, but open to you. You have all that God has revealed to mankind available to you. Since it's his creation, and he is the author of it, then he is the one that best knows how to live within it. And so it becomes our textbook, our instruction manual as well as the way that we come to grow in our knowledge of Him, which is the way that we honor and glorify Him in our lives. It is all because of the Spirit of God and His illuminating work uh, in us. And then in Ephesians, uh, what did we say? We were at 1, Ephesians 3, and verse 16. <clears throat> he says that you may that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Well, what does it mean to be strengthened in the inner man by his spirit? 
Well, it is an interesting tension between this growth that's going on in us, which happens as we yield ourselves to him. So it's seeing more and more of him in our life and less and less of us in our life. And in that process, we become conformed into the image of Christ. But you possess power. What kind of power? But what kind of power is it? Well, it's, it's the power to live life in a manner that glorifies him. That is, it is the power to resist temptation. It is the power over sin and the wiles of the devil. It is the power that comes to those who can live lives in a manner that we just talked about. Living their lives not blown around by every wind of doctrine and error and not succumbing to every adverse circumstance that happens in their life, but rather they live their lives trusting God. What? Rejoicing always, praying without ceasing, giving thanks in all things. Those are realities of the Christian life that only happen by the Spirit of God and the power that the Spirit of God provides to you. They're not, it's not a mystical thing. It isn't a bunch of weird um, events or circumstances that happen. It is the power to live life glorifying God and being thankful in the troubles and the trials that come. And that's because you possess the Spirit of God. And you possess the ability to understand what God says in his word. Because the spirit of God always uses the word of God in this process of growing us uh, into Christ's likeness. In, uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, he gives us spiritual gifts. Uh, what, what are spiritual gifts? Well, they're, they're, they're gifts primarily for edification. They're for edification of the church. They're for spiritual service. So they are many times things that we are all called to do. There's just a supernatural enabling that God gives to some. One of the gifts that everybody wants that's uh, often um, spoken of in the, ch in, the, in the church is the gift of giving. Everyone wants the gift of giving, right? You, well, but generally, it, it comes right with all the other gifts everybody talks. When you talk about the gifts of the Spirit, everybody wants the gift of giving, right? So that you can su supernaturally give, right? Yes. 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 Well, probably, probably not, you know. Why not? And yet, and yet, some people have this gift. It, 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 I mean, they're generally uh, very humble people. They're they're not noticeable. People don't know about them. Uh, but but they are just people that uh, that give beyond what is the giving that a Christian would give. And we are all are supposed to be sacrificial givers. So giving is for all of us. But some people have a supernatural ability. Uh, to give, uh, similar w with other gifts, a gift of administration or the gift of counseling or all of those things are supernatural enablements uh, that God gives to some for the edification of the body or teaching or preaching. Uh, so that all is um, directly related, again, to the, to the work of the Spirit of God uh, in us as Christians. Notice something. Go with me to Romans chapter 8 for a minute. In Romans chapter 8, in, um, again, we won't spend some time with it, but 8, 5, and 6, 12, once again, is the victory over sin that we can have uh, by the power of the Spirit of God uh, in us. But look at, um, look at 8, 26. It says, um, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray. For as we ought, but the Spirit well, Himself makes intercession uh, for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I just I marvel at this verse because most Christians spend all their time on groanings which cannot be uttered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Now, now let me let me walk this through you. This is a this is biblical interpretation. This this is heavy hermeneutics. Right? This verse says cannot be uttered. Do you see that? Why do people want to utter? Why, why do people want to say, I can utter? It's what I'm doing. I'm uttering just like the Spirit of God when I do these things. No, no, you can't. You, you cannot. Because this is inter-Trinitarian communication. 
And, and in this communication between the Spirit and the Father, the Spirit is praying for us. For things that we don't know what to pray for. I mean, think about it for a minute. Our prayers are really quite limited. They're, they're really quite limited. Because we are limited. We are limited in terms of our understanding to the place we sit. I mean, we have no idea what's going on any place around us right now. We are very limited in terms of the overall scope of the plan of God and what he's doing and how he's interrelating all of the things that are going on in uh, this world. We are ex extremely limited in many times our focus on the issues that we have ourselves. <laughs> But, but, but we are limited in our intellect. We are limited in our presence. We're just limited in our ability to really pray in conformance with all that God is doing because he is God and he's just so much bigger than we are. And we are also limited in the events that we have because sometimes you just don't know what to pray for. How do I pray in this particular circumstance? And the Spirit of God assures us that he will deal with that. He will pray for us as our hearts are right and as our hearts are yielded up uh, to his uh, spirit. In, in 8.16, in 8.16 he says, um, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. It is the spirit of God in you that gives you the assurance that you're a child of God. There's, um, again, we've talked about this uh, several times before, but there's really a number of ways, principally two, that you can know that you're a Christian. One is the internal witness and testimony of the Spirit of God assuring you that you're a child of God. The other, because those can be counterfeit, the other ways of determining that is your testing yourself to see if you're in the faith. And how do you test yourself? You test it by the criterion of the Word of God. So the Word of God says you will be a different person. You will be transformed. You will love the Lord. You will love His Word. You will love the brethren. You will no longer love sin. You will no longer love the world. You are different. And so God gives us these objective criteria by which we can test ourselves to see that we are in fact new creations and the Spirit of God is in fact dwelling in us. And then we can be assured by the reality of his presence that we are in fact his children. He doesn't want us to make any mistakes. And it is the Spirit of God that allows us to do that by his illumining the truth of the Word of God to us and by his personal assurance to us as he dwells uh, in us. Look at Romans chapter 5 for a minute. Uh, this, is, uh, this is just, they're all overwhelming, but th this one... Uh, um, this one kind of overwhelms me. Romans 5.5. 5. <clears throat> now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in your hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The love of God. God's love is in you by His Spirit. His love is upon you by His work on the cross by what Jesus says. There's no greater act of love that God can give you than to send his son to die on the cross for you and to bring his love through the presence of his spirit to you to indwell you. God loves you. <laughs> what an amazing truth. Oh, what manner of love is this, John says, that we should be called the children. We, right, you and me should be called the children of God. And so we possess this love. It's, it's granted to us, and now we possess this love, and this very love that has saved us when we were enemies and such rotten sinners, that love is now available in and through us to give to others, to love them mm -hmm. supernaturally, sacrificially, selflessly, because it is a supernatural love love that you possess because God himself dwells in you and has shed it abroad 
in your heart. How rich, how rich are we? And then, a familiar verse in, in Galatians 5.22. It is because of the Spirit and the Spirit's work in us that we can now manifest these kinds of attributes, most of which belong to God. And they are attributes that, man, that, that give evidence to us that the Spirit of God is controlling our life in the circumstances we face. And they are fruit. They're fruit of the Spirit. They're fruit of His work in us, changing us. And they are familiar. They are what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So, it, it is the Spirit of God that brings things about. So, if you look at these things, you can always test yourself. See how you're doing. And we'll talk about how you're doing in relationship to the Spirit of God in the moment. This isn't so much a test of your ultimate salvation, although it is if you don't experience any of these things. But this is, in fact, a test of what we're going to talk about in a minute. That is the work of God progressively sanctifying you toward glory. So, how, how are you? Are you kind? I love these tests. <laughs> I always get all these blank, I get these blank looks, you know. Now, the, the, the test is, I, I, I don't want you to ask yourself if you're kind, although that would be a good place to start. <laughs> What, what we need to do is ask someone that knows us if we're kind. <laughs> I mean, really knows us. Or um, patient. Are you, are you patient? I, I mean, did you make it out of your driveway today? <laughs> down the street, down the road? Are, are you patient? Are you gentle? Do, do, do you have self-control? Or do you fly off in anger and upset? And, well, all I'm saying is the Spirit of God dwells in us. Therefore, we have the resource, the call, and the command to yield ourselves to Him. And that's who we should be. And that should be the process by which God has us in. And as we mature in Him, as we grow in Him, more and more, this is what we would see in our life. More and more, we would be people that manifested the fruit of the Spirit of God in all circumstances. That's a mark of our own our own Christian maturity. So coming back then to this discussion in uh, 1 Thessalonians. Um, so, so we set the groundworks by reviewing some things that, we, that you already knew about how important the Spirit of God is to us, what a magnificent resource He is in our Christian living, and what some of the manifestations of that reality uh, are, what some of those manifestations are. So we are called, then, to, to live rightly in relationship to the Spirit of God whom we now possess. Okay? So the, your, your Christian life will be directly related to how well you do in your relationship with the Spirit of God. And there are four things, principally, that the Bible talks about in your relationship and my relationship with Him. Two of them are negative, and two of them are positive. So we'll take the positive ones first. In Ephesians 5, 8, the scripture says, Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. It then goes on uh, to, to lay out... Well, let's, let's go there. I, I'm, I'm starting to... Too much of me, not enough of the scripture. Let's, let's go to Ephesians. And in chapter 5, it says, uh, yeah, well, 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So that's generally where we stop in our understanding. But what I want to point out to you and, and encourage you to further study is this idea of being filled with the Spirit, it, 
flows through the balance of the book of Ephesians. In other words, if you're going to if you're going to be a right husband and love your wives correctly, if you're going to be a right wife and love your husband correctly, if you're going to be a right employer, employee, a, a right uh, parent or child, or, or in any of your relationships, all of them and all of the exhortations that are in these verses are dependent on your being filled with the Spirit. Apart from that, you're a legalist. You, you're a legalist. You know, if, if you're just if you're just set about to trying to be as good a person as you can in all of these, and and you're you're trying to, you know, pull it up, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, and be a good folks. You, I mean, you could be like a Roman neighbor and Roman, a Mormon neighbor. You 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 can be like any religious person. That is not what this is. These are all exhortations in how a Christian lives when they're under the control of the Spirit of God so that the love of God manifests in all of these relationships, in, in who you are and all the things that you do, if you're filled with the Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? It means to be under the control of, that's all. I mean, that's the essence of it. The Spirit of God controls you, and if the Spirit of God controls you, then, then you will manifest these kinds of joyful, submissive, thankful, spiritually powerful ways of, of responding and interacting with the issues of life, including your most difficult enemies and people that cause you the most trouble. It is the Spirit of God that allows you to live a life that glorifies Him. Pure and simple. Now, you, can, you may look good once in a while, and you may not be filled with the Spirit, because again, you can be religious. We can all be self-righteous and religious. But if it's working right, it's because the Spirit of God is changing you from the inside, and the manifestations of it are these. So 5.8 says to be filled. In Galatians 5.16, it says to walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. They're contrary to one another. In other words, if you're walking in the Spirit, you're not living the way you used to live. You're not thinking the way you used to think. You're not speaking the way you used to speak. You are, in fact, following and going where He wants you to go. It, when, you're, when you're filled with the Spirit, you're under His control. When you're walking in the Spirit, you're going in His direction. And listen, the Spirit of God is always leading you toward the Lord, the Spirit of God is always leading you toward holiness. And you could continue. The Spirit of God is always leading you toward humility. The Spirit of God is always leading you toward love. And the Spirit of God is always leading you in ways that will give glory to God. So those are the right ways. You have to be filled with the Spirit, and you have to be walking in the Spirit. The negative ways of which we're looking at one of them here are two. In Ephesians 4.3 it says, do not grieve the Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Spirit of God. Now, that tells you a number of things. First of all, it reiterates the fact that the Spirit of God is a person. He is God in every respect, but he possesses personhood. You, you can't grieve a power source. You, 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 know, you, can't, you can't grieve something that's ethereal or is, is impersonal. The Spirit of God is a person, and you can see that in um, Acts 5 in the Ananias and Sapphira account, where the accusation that Peter raises against Ananias is that he did not lie. He lied to the Holy Spirit, and he did not lie to man, but he lied to God. So the Spirit of God possesses all of the attributes of God. He is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, holy, immutable, all of those attributes, and he is a person in his personhood. That is, he has will, and he has feeling, and he has intellect. He, he is a person. He is spirit. Our God is spirit, but he possesses the attributes of personhood. Too much theology here, I know, but it's important. So, you can grieve him because he is, because he is a person. You can grieve him in that you can um, you, you can make him uh, unhappy. You can displease him. And how would you do that? Well, you'd, you'd be doing things that displease him. You'd be doing things that dishonor the Lord. And you'd be doing the things that would be opposite of what it would be to be filled with the Spirit. 
you, you'll grieve the Lord when you're angry, when you're unforgiving. You'll grieve the Lord when you're impatient. Um, you'll grieve the Lord when you're not thankful. In, in all of those things, if you're not where he wants you to be under the control of the Spirit manifesting those things, then you're going to be grieving him because you're not going in the direction that he wants you to go. And then the next thing is this one that we have here, you know, quenching the Spirit of God. So you can grieve him, make him unhappy, sad, and you can quench him, which means to stop him to extinguish his work uh, in your life. Um, and, and how do you do that? Well, there are probably many ways. I just jotted down a few that kind of came to mind. But um, how, do you, how do you quench what the Spirit of God is doing in your life? Uh, so now, see, what, what you should be doing is thinking in your own mind. How can I do that? Well, let me give you a couple, I, I think. One, you can fail to trust him. You can fail to trust him. You, you, can, you can fail in the issues of life to trust him and do what he tells you to do in, in your obedience. You can rather turn to the world's wisdom. You can turn to the, way, the world's way of thinking. You can turn to the world's methods of solving things and move yourself away from the Spirit of God. You're effectively saying, uh, I think there's a better way. I really believe Sigmund Freud has a lot better answers than you do. I just threw that in. For... <laughs> or you can, uh, you, you can, you can, you can quench him by your uh, pride, by your self-will, by your, uh, by your thinking that you, that you don't need him, that you have the answers. You know, and we all are guilty of that. I've got my plan A, B, and C, and if none of those works, I'm coming to you, Lord. Right. But, but, but I'm, not, I'm not in submission to you. I'm not seeking you. I'm not seeking your direction. I'm setting about in this world on my own. Or you can be indifferent. You know, you can just be indifferent to what he says. And, and, and this is a huge problem in the church today. Uh, it, it, and it's marked by biblical ignorance. I mean, if, if you're big, biblically ignorant, generally it means that you are indifferent to truth. You really don't want to take the time to learn. You don't want to take the time to know. And I'm convinced that many Christians would rather be ignorant because that allows them to be self-willed and do what they want because <laughs> they don't come face to face with what the Word of God says many times. I've, I've, you know, I've been privileged to teach Bible studies for years, but I, I, at some point in those Bible studies, I've always said the same thing. The Word of God assaults you. Yeah. It assaults the way you think. And if you're not being assaulted, then you're probably not spending enough time in the Word of God because God's thoughts are not our thoughts and His ways are not our ways. I think one of the um, ways you can quench the Spirit is um, y you can fail to seek an intimate relationship with your God. Y you, you, can, you can be the corollary of biblical ignorance. You can, you, can get, you can get your enjoyment all out of the knowledge, the understanding. And that's really good. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I, the bigger problem is ignorance. But there is also the problem that your pursuit of knowledge fails to drive you to your knees in your personal relationship with your God. It, is, um, it, it, it doesn't take you to Psalm 42.1. So go with me to Psalm 42.1 for a minute. I just love this song. Are we out of time yet? I don't have a clock, so you're in danger. I got it. Psalm 42.1. Psalm 42.1. Listen to this. Is this you? Is this me? Listen. You think this is your As the deer pants for the water brook, so yeah. pants my soul for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Yes. Is that you? Is that me? Yeah. Does your soul thirst for Him? And do you seek Him in His revelation? Do you seek Him based on what He says about Himself? Do you meditate on His truths about Himself and about what He does? Do you meditate on the reality of what He's done in your life and what He's done for you and what He continues to do and the hope that's available to you? Do you seek intimacy with Him? 
And then, uh, I mean, you know, my favorite verse is kind of a summary as a way we can quench the spirit. Go to me to Jeremiah. I'm not, it would be my, one of my favorite in the Old Testament. I, Jeremiah, no, Jeremiah chapter 9. And verse 23 and 24. Thus saith the Lord. He says, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. In these things I delight, says the Lord. Is your desire to glorify him in all things or do you still hang on to your own pride your, the pride of your intellect the pride of your wealth the pride of your position sometimes even the pride of being a Christian <laughs> or do you do all things recognizing that he is all in all and he is the one that deserves all of our worship and all of our allegiance and he is the one that's provided all good things to us apart from him we can do and we are nothing. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time in your word today. Thank you for your spirit who indwells us. What a treasure he is, Lord. I think we uh, discount him, Lord. We don't spend enough time thinking on him as the resource that he is, as the amazing gift that you have provided uh, to us. For by him, your word is open to us, and by him we can have communion with you in prayer. By him we can have victory over sin. By him we can know that we belong to you. By him we have your love shed abroad in our hearts, available to give out to those that need it so desperately. Nothing we do has any eternal value if it isn't done in and through and by him in our life, Lord. So, heaven forbid, Father, that we would grieve him or quench him. Help us, Lord, to love you as we fully submit our lives to your spirit and live for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.